Hey folks, thank you so much for joining us this morning for an overview of the new IDLE maturity model. I'm Lindsay with Beyond 20 here to introduce our two fabulous panelists today. We are joined by David Crouch and Adam Griffith. David is a senior advisor for us here at Beyond 20 and Adam is with us from the Axlos perspective as we go through the ins and outs of this exciting new release. Adam, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what brings you here today? Good morning, everyone. Welcome and happy holidays. My name is Adam Griffith. I am an IT best practice consultant with Axelos and member of the architect team that created the maturity model. I am thrilled to be here uh, to uh, to share with you the uh, some of the overview uh, of the ITIL maturity model uh, and to tell you as well that Beyond 20 is uniquely positioned uh, to to take the lead on on assessments uh, based upon Beyond 20's participation uh, and contributions to the ITIL 4 framework, uh, their experience uh, in uh, service management uh, and, and consulting as well. So I'm thrilled to be here. Um, and at that, let me turn things over to David Crouch with Beyond 20. David, go ahead. Thanks, Adam. I'm David Crouch. Uh, I'm super excited to be to be here today. We have had so many questions on the new ITIL maturity model so far, so hopefully we can answer a lot of those questions today. Uh, my background is really, I spent about 20 years at Johns Hopkins University and also working on the healthcare side, uh, working in the service management um, world, so doing Gosh, probably not everything you could do in service management, but it sure felt like it. Um, I am now a senior advisor and consultant at Beyond 20. So uh, when I'm not consulting I'm sp and doing assessments and, and things of that nature, spend a lot of my time training in all of the all of the various ITIL courses and also uh, project management courses. And I'm coming to you today from uh, from my home in uh, in Baltimore, the greatest city in America, as we like to call it here. Who doesn't love Charm City? Cool. Well, David, do you want to tell us a little bit about Beyond 20 and then uh, jump into the agenda for today? Yeah, sure thing. So um, Beyond 20, uh, really our mission is to change work life. Um, we've been doing this now for 15 years, uh, really more than 15 years. Um, we have done a number of really remarkable things with ITIL over the years. Most recently, um, we served as uh, the lead editors and authors of the ITIL 4 digital and IT strategy publication and, uh, and worked with some other wonderful folks from around the world on that publication in terms of authoring it. Uh, we are the only elite Axelos consulting partner in the United States that can, can perform these ITIL maturity assessments. So that is, uh, that is super exciting. Um, We've actually been doing this. So the ITIL maturity model is new. The ITIL maturity assessment per se is new, but we've been doing IT service management assessments for more than 15 years. So, um, so something old, something new. We are not new to this game. We've been doing it for a long time. We also do business process assessments, other types of maturity assessments. Um, routinely, our clients come to us to, to help them with service catalog workshops, helping them with configuration management and coming up with a, a CMDB process mapping, metrics workshops, uh, you name it. So um, we are deeply involved in, in the IT service management space. Um, we also, as I alluded to in my introduction, also provide training. So every ITIL course, we also offer project management courses, scrum courses, uh, security courses, and also a whole, um, a whole array of data analytics uh, courses. And, uh, and last but not least, um, one of the core parts of our businesses uh, are, is uh, tool implementation. So we also implement and support both the ServiceNow and the ShareWell platforms. <coughs> and so with that, let me, uh, let me bring up the agenda here just to give you an idea of what we're gonna talk about today. So first of all, we're gonna introduce the ITIL maturity model. What is the purpose of it? What is this all about? What are the key components of it? Then we will move into the different assessment approaches. So there are basically three different um, approaches that we can uh, take to an ITIL maturity assessment. And then we'll move from there to talking a little bit about how we um, score the assessment. And we'll talk about, you know, what are the objective criteria that are used to, to score both uh, the practices that you 
may want to investigate, but also your, your service value system, your business model as a whole. And finally, we'll end off by talking about um, how you can obtain some validation or certification um, of the maturity level that you've achieved or the practice capability level you've achieved and, uh, and a word on how this information from the assessments are going to be used to create a benchmarking uh, powerhouse. Okay, so let's start off with, uh, with the overview. So what is the ITIL maturity model? Um, in fact, the ITIL maturity model, curiously, is really the first of its kind. Um, this was released by Axelos in, uh, in this year, in 2021. And uh, interestingly, although, although some level of maturity models in the world at large have been around for a long time, there was no, uh, prior to the ITIL maturity model, there was really no um, maturity model that specifically and objectively addressed um, what we talk about in IT service management. So one of the big benefits of this tool is not only an objective assessment based on uh, based on defined criteria, but also a very comprehensive assessment. So the maturity model can help you to address, broadly speaking, your service management capabilities. It can help you to look at your service value system. And we'll talk a little bit more in a few moments about what is the service value system for those, uh, for those of you who are new to ITIL 4. But really, in a nutshell, the service value system is the business model, the business model for ITIL. And you can also use the maturity model to really focus on your specific practices. And we'll talk, talk a little bit more about what practices means in this context. But for the moment, just think about the core practices um, that we all know and love, things like incident management, uh, change enablement, problem management. So you can assess that as well using the uh, ITIL maturity model. Now, I know, Adam, you are uh, you were part of the um, development and release of the ITIL maturity model. Anything to add in terms of uh, the uniqueness here? No, I think uh, I, I think one of the the key terms there, David, that that you've highlighted is objectively, um, and uh, not to provide too much of a spoiler for what you will certainly get get into a little later on, but the fact that if organizations represented here have not yet embraced ITIL four. Uh, does that mean that this maturity model is somehow out of scope for those organizations? Uh, and that's absolutely not true. Uh, governance is still governance, whether or not you have adopted or adapted the ITIL 4 framework or not. Uh, guiding principles still exist uh, that the practices, although some organizations may still call those processes, that those still exist as well. So uh, I, I like, again, that you're, you're emphasizing the idea of the maturity model being very objective. Um, and again, I don't want to give too much away. Maybe we'll get into that a little bit later on. But no, I think ideally exactly what folks need to know here. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. We'll talk a little bit more about the, object, uh, the object, objectivity of it as we get into this. But um, that's one of the key selling points to me. You know, we're not, uh, nobody's making this up <laughs> along the way. They're actually very concrete criteria for evaluation. Okay, so what are some of the reasons that you might do an assessment in the first place? Um, probably the biggest reason that most, uh, that most organizations are interested in is looking at their current state. So how are we doing with something right now? Whether, whether that has to do with governance, how are we doing with governance right now? Um, or it could be a specific set of practices. You know, we know that we need to do something to improve our service desk practice. We need to improve something with our change enablement practice, but we're not really quite sure how we're doing right now. That's probably the biggest reason why organizations would want to do an assessment in the first place. It helps to identify some of your weaknesses. Um, it also helps to support your planning. So, okay, um, now that we've assessed the current state, where do we want to be? Where do we think good is for our organization? And then what is some of the planning that needs to go into making that happen? Essentially, um, part of a gap analysis, really. You could also, some organizations also uh, want to assess to track the prog progress of current improvement efforts. So we see it all the time. An organization comes to us and says, you know, five years ago, um, three years ago, whatever the case is, we did an assessment of a particular set of practices within our organization or ITIL processes. 
and we've made some improvements or we think we've made some improvements, but we don't quite know, did we really improve? Where are we at right now? So you can use this to track your progress. Um, benchmark against other organizations that are similar to yours. We'll talk about that more towards the end of this presentation, what that means for the ITIL maturity model. And, um, and really, when you think about it, an assessment is really one of the first steps in terms of supporting continual improvement. We hopefully are, are not just assessing as an academic exercise, we're doing it because we actually want to improve. And, uh, and as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the other reason that you might want to assess is to obtain some sort of formal certification or confirmation that is independent and objective that says this is the level where you are as a service provider. So let's get into what comprises or what makes up the maturity assessment. So first of all, um, anybody who has taken an ITO4 foundation class or has read some of the, the material will be familiar with the four dimensions, the four dimensions of service management. Now, if you're not uh, familiar specifically with the four dimensions, it's very likely that you've heard this mantra, people, process, and technology. That is very similar to the four dimensions, four big picture areas of pretty much any organization and certainly any IT organization that we should consider with everything that we do. We have to care about what does our organizational structure look like? What does culture look like within our own organization? Do we have the right people, the right roles and the right skills? We need to be concerned about what technology you know, we're using. Do we have an ITSM platform that's working for us? Do we have good knowledge bases? Do we have good workflow uh, systems? We need to be concerned about our third party suppliers. Um, who are we uh, purchasing from? Are they performing the way we want them to perform? Uh, and also partners. So it's not only uh, people that we buy something from, but partners that we go in on with, uh, with certain initiatives. And then finally, value streams and processes, right? So do we have the right processes in place to support all of these other dimensions? Do we have value streams that connect one process to another, that connect one silo, one department to another? So you'll see as we get into this that the ITIL maturity model is clearly tagged to the four dimensions of service management, um, specifically capability criteria that are used for assessment is tied to each of these, uh, each of the four dimensions. The capability, uh, the ITIL maturity model also focuses on the service value system as a whole. So again, if, you've, uh, if you're familiar with ITIL4, you'll be familiar with this graphic. If not, at a high level, think about this as the business model for ITIL. So we have guiding principles. Every organization arguably has guiding principles, whether or not they know it. ITIL has seven guiding principles that we consider recommendations that support good decision-making. However, even if you don't use ITIL's guiding principles, even if you don't have a formally articulated set of guiding principles, you certainly have some values in your company, whether they are identified or not. Governance. How do we control the organization? How do we make sure that all of those things that we document in our plans, in our strategic plans, our tactical plans, um, in compliance documents, that we are actually doing them? The service value chain. The service value chain really high level activities that, in, that interconnect with each other that help us to put the service value system into action, that help us to take this opportunity and demand over here and turn it into products and services that are valuable to customers. In essence, it's basically the operating model. And then of course we have practices. So we are all likely familiar with practices Practices are just resources that are used to, to accomplish an objective, right? So, um, you know, you may think of practices as things like incident management, service desk, change enablement, problem management, configuration management, et cetera. ITIL 4 has 34 defined practices. And then finally, we, uh, we could not complete our business model with continual, without continual improvement. So when we talk about continual improvement, we're talking about gradually getting better, gradu gradually aligning with our overall business. So you can actually use the ITIL maturity model to assess each individual component of the service value system. And I think, I think that is wonderful uh, because a lot of organizations 
focus just on one area. A lot of organizations focus very strictly on maybe not even practice improvement, but individual process improvement. And that's fine. Sometimes that is absolutely what's in order. But if you're not taking a look at some of these other areas, essentially the ecosystem within which you operate, you, you may be missing something. So, um, you know, Adam and I were talking about this the other day. I mean, I think that one of the big benefits here is that you have the option of assessing your entire ecosystem of, of IT service management. Yeah, exactly. And then understanding as a result mm -hmm. how maturity in one of these five components of the SVS has an impact or an influence on the other four. And I, I can't tell you, even before the ITIL maturity model came out, how many organizations invited us to come in and look at, you know, kind of your core IT service management practices, again, incident management, service request management, et cetera. But then when we, when we get into the organization, we say, well, there are some areas where you can improve with those practices, but really the issues that you have maybe lie more in the areas of governance or within continual improvement or one of these other components. Okay, <clears throat> one really key thing to remember here, and, I, and Adam alluded to it in the beginning, is that the ITIL maturity model is based on these ITIL four concepts and the ITIL architecture. But an organization does not specifically need to implement ITIL guidance to do one of these assessments. So think of this uh, maturity model as ITIL inspired or based on ITIL. But even if you don't call it, for example, incident management, even if you don't call something guiding principles, there's a pretty good chance that you have something like that going on in your organization. So, you know, we, we often use this phrase as consultants, adapt, not adopt. That's what this assessment is about. How well have you adapted ITIL for like concepts? How well have you adapted best practices in IT service management but not necessarily adopt them, adopted them blindly. ITIL pretty much never recommends that you follow the books blindly. It is more about how do you make this work in your own environment. So along those lines, the ITIL maturity model does not do certain things. Um, it does not assess compliance with regulations. We are not looking at, are you complying with the laws or standards? Those are important too, but there are other models out there that help you to do that. Um, one thing it does not do is it does not determine or assess whether your service management goals are supporting your larger business objectives. That's important, but the model does not do it. And the other thing that is out of scope for the ITIL maturity model is we really are not assessing progress or maturity of your organization or any of its initiatives beyond IT service management. You know, so we're not looking at questions like, are you, are you in the right marketplace? Are you... Um, are you offering from a non-IT perspective, you know, from a larger business perspective, are you connecting to the right customers? Are you offering them the right, uh, you know, the right consumer products and services? And I think that's a really key point because sometimes organizations say, well, we're not really doing ITIL, so to speak. Uh, you know, we're not doing it. We know that we're not doing it in the way that best practice would suggest. So does this even apply to us? And I'm sure, Adam, you've probably heard comments uh, similar to that as well. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a, an excellent point. Uh, one other that uh, I'll circle back around for just a moment that David mentioned as well. Uh, this idea that there is, uh, that, the, that the maturity model does not assess whether or not you have uh, adopted ITIL 4 per se or even ITIL per se. Uh, so one of the uh, criteria, for instance, does the organization have a consistent continual improvement uh, method or technique that's used across <clears throat> the organization? The question is not, does the organization use the ITIL for continual Im improvement model? Does the organization use any sort of continual improvement model, not a requirement that it be anything that is specifically specified in the framework or in the publications? Okay. So one common question that um, that we get a lot, um, I wrote about this a little bit in a blog article recently, is so, you know, how new is this, right? There are other maturity models out there. This ITIL maturity model isn't the first maturity model at large, so to speak. And so I find it really useful to compare it to 
you know, I think the, the maturity model that is probably closest to it, and that would be CMMI, which is a, a very good model. We use it internally um, for certain things. Our clients often have used the, the, um, the Carnegie Mellon um, uh, created model here, but let's compare the two. So they both provide a maturity scale. And in a few moments, when we talk about scoring, you will see that the ITIL maturity model basically is using the CMMI maturity scale. There's very little um, difference between the two. But the big difference is that CMMI is broader, right? CMMI is not really focused on IT service management alone. You can use it for other areas of an organization, um, but it's really not tailored to IT like the ITIL maturity model is. The other really important point, and we've hit on it before, but it's worth bringing it up many times, is that the ITIL maturity model provides very specific concrete criteria to address IT service management practices. Um, I've seen so many assessments over the years, some better and some worse, but some of those assessments, when you look at the criteria that um, a consulting organization has used, you kind of scratch your head and you wonder, does that really make sense? Because I'm not sure that I heard that one before. Some of them are perfectly fine, but I, I have seen many where at, at a minimum, you can say that the criteria was very subjective and it was a little bit hard to interpret what the criteria actually meant. This model, there's no guesswork. It is defined by Axelos. It is there for the, uh, for the certified assessor to use and to look at. And, uh, and that objectivity, that independence, that, that uh, concreteness, I think is something that is sorely, sorely lacking in other models that are used to address ITSM. We also, in the ITIL maturity model, assess guiding principles and values. Again, not every organization calls them guiding principles and values, but we're talking about recommendations. We're talking about culture. We're not talking about strictly policy. You know, that is something that, you know, CMMI does not directly address. Um, and we also look at the business model. So talk about comprehensive. We just talked about ITIL's business model. Um, all five of those components are something that the ITIL maturity model is really designed to address and to assess. And then, of course, an assessment of governance. So, um, you know, again, the ITIL maturity model is not the first maturity model in the world. In fact, I think it's probably fair to say that even the term maturity model was probably first uh, coined sometime, I think, in the 70s, possibly in the 50s, depending on who you ask. But this is the very first one that focuses on the things that we talk about in IT service management. Okay, so let's move on to some of the different um, assessment approaches. So with the ITIL maturity model, there are basically three assessment types. The first one that we can talk about is called the comprehensive assessment. I like to call it, you know, the big enchilada because it is the works. With this particular type of assessment, you are looking at every individual component of the service value system. So you're looking at guiding principles, continual improvement, governance, the service value chain practices. But you're also looking at at least seven specific practices. So one of those practices is always going to be continual improvement. It is considered so important that, conti that specifically whatever practices your organization has around continual improvement is part of the assessment, plus at least six other practices. So there are some organizations out there recently who have said, you know, we're not just interested in looking at seven practices, we're interested in looking at 20 practices, we're interested in looking at 30 practices, but it doesn't have to be that, but at least seven practices, one of which has to be continual improvement. The other six practices are based on the customized scope, right? That would be based on um, your organization speaking with the official assessment, you know, the, the consultant, the assessor organization, determining what are the six other practices that are going to most benefit your organization. Um, what we often do is we would identify some core practices and then also some supporting practices. So as an example, just one specific example, change enablement, formerly called change management. Um, it can be really difficult to do a great job of analyzing risk within that practice, unless you're also doing a fairly decent job of configuration management. So could you do a good job of change enablement if you don't have a CMDB? It's possible, but it's a lot harder. So in that case, an organization may say, I want to 
identify change enablement as the primary practice I'm assessing, but also I recognize that configuration management, service configuration management is a pretty important supporting practice. I want to look at that one, you know, in a sense, secondarily, you know, as a supporting practice to change enablement. Um, that would be a discussion between your organization and the service provider. And Adam, does that does that does that sound about uh, right on in terms of the primary practice and the uh, supporting practices? It absolutely does. There is um, no practical reason why an organization would uh, embrace all practices at the same level. Conceptually, theoretically, all practices are equal. Practically, in terms of application, they are not. There are practices that are going to be more important to some organizations, less so to others as well. So being able to categorize them in this kind of primary and supporting way allows you to establish those where you are looking to uh, gain those higher levels of maturity because there is a real business impact for it. And then those that are supporting, maybe the goal of higher levels of maturity isn't a necessity. Maybe it would be seen as uh, as a bad investment as long as it achieves some sort of minimum level of maturity because it exists in support of other practices. Yeah, I think that's exactly it, David. So, you know, when we talk about the comprehensive assessment, this um, this offering is really in depth, right? You are analyzing basically your entire ecosystem, including some core and possibly supporting practices. When would an organization do a comprehensive assessment when you're really when you're really in it, right? When you're really, you know, I'm committed to improvement. I have some resources that I want to commit to this and I want to really do a comprehensive improvement initiative because that's absolutely what the organi organization needs right now. We can't rely on just improving a few practices. We need to look at the, the whole ball of wax, so to speak. A second version of the assessment is the high level maturity assessment. So with this assessment, we have, um, we have a little bit of flexibility here. An organization could choose to only look at the service value system without looking at any practices. So look at guiding principles, look at governance, et cetera, without looking at any specific practices. Or an organization could choose to look at the service value system and a few practices, but again, something fewer than seven practices. You know, if you are looking at practices, once again, continual improvement is always going to be included as one of those practices. As, as with the comprehensive assessment, any additional practices that you that you decide to assess, that is going to be a conversation between you and the organization that's providing the assessment. What's in scope for this? The depth of this one depends on depends on how you go with it. If you're only looking at the service value system and you only want to know what are the basic areas where I'm strong and weak, this can be a really high level assessment for some organizations. You know, if you're looking at specific practices you're getting the same capability criteria that you would get with any three of these. So that's gonna provide you a little bit more detail. When would you use something like this? You want a basic snapshot of your current state. You know, um, we wanna get, you know, a big picture of how our ecosystem is generally within IT um, and or we have a few practices that we'd really like to improve, but we need to know more information about them. And then the third option here is uh, for organizations that are only interested in assessing practices. So we don't want an, want an assessment right now of the entire service value system. Maybe we did something like that you know, pretty recently, but we do know that, for example, our change enablement practice isn't doing so well, but we really need to assess it to see you know, where we're at right now and how we can improve. So this would be for one or more practices um, you know, but no service value system is assessed. What is the depth on this? It really depends on the scope. If we're talking about assessing a handful of practices and supporting practices, you're probably gonna get a lot of depth. If we're talking about just a high level, a couple of practices that we're looking at, but we're not identifying the practices that support, you know, the primary practice that you're interested in, then the depth isn't gonna be quite as much. Um, you're still gonna get valuable information, but probably more depth if you identify primary and supporting practices. So when would you use this? You have a pretty good idea that some of our practices need to be improved. 
but you need to really get a, an understanding of the current state and you really want to focus specifically on practice improvement. So what's nice about this from my perspective is that uh, ITIL is recognizing that there is not one size that fits all. Um, organizations are starting at different points. We have three different basic types of assessment that can do that. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about maturity levels. So if we are assessing the entire service value system, ITIL provides a one to five scale, one to five level scale on how we can adjust, uh, assess maturity. So for example, if we're looking at guiding principles, if we're looking at governance, this is the scale that we're using. And for any of the folks out there that are familiar with CMMI, you may find this to be familiar because these different levels are basically the same. Um, level one is initial. If you're assessed at level one, work is getting done, but, but you know, your overall purpose of your ecosystem, your service value system, is not always being achieved. If you're achieving something, it's probably a little bit, a little bit luck, or because you have really good people, but not necessarily um, a lot of intentionality behind your business model. Level two is what we call managed. So there is some planning that's going uh, that's going on. There is some performance measurement, but again. Um, What's really lacking with manage is the repeatability. So sometimes we're successful, sometimes we're not, but we don't really have any standards or repeatable elements of our business model in place that we can consistently rely on doing that thing you know, very well the next time. We reach level three, that is called defined. So with defined, that basically suggests that we have organization-wide standards that are providing us guidance across our entire service value system. So think things like repeatable processes, best practices, expectations that are set, um, values that are known and communicated across the organization and agreed to. We get to a level four and level four really focuses on data, right? So we're doing all of these other things. We've achieved everything in level one, we've achieved everything in level two, we've achieved everything in level three, but now we're adding more data to it. We are making decisions based on data. We're not just making decisions based on, on our gut feeling for something. We're using quantitative data to make decisions. And then finally, we have optimizing, and optimizing is really where we focus on continual improvement. We're doing everything that we had to from steps one through four, but now we are really focused on always getting better. And I think, um, you know, I remember uh, being one of the authors of the digital and, uh, and IT strategy publication. When we talk about digital transformation, some of the best organizations out there, one thing that is, I think, in common with all of them is that they're always trying to get better. You know, they're number one in the marketplace, but that's not good enough because they know that tomorrow, you know, a competitor can knock them out of that position. So they're always thinking about this is great for today, but how do I tear it down and build up something new? How do I incrementally improve, you know, the good work that I'm already doing? Um, so you know, one of the things that I think about with the maturity level here is that as you rise from a level one to a level five, a couple of things come out, you know, stand out to me. One we become more repeatable as we get from a level one to a level five, uh, a level five more standards when it's appropriate, more repeatable process. Um, the other thing is data. As we rise from a one to a five, we're using data increasingly to make good decisions. And then the other thing that really occurs to me is continual improvement. At a level one, we can't really continually improve very well because we're, we don't really know how we do things right now. But as we rise from a one to a five, there is more of a focus on how could we do this better? We don't always need a revolution. Sometimes it is, it is very gradual, small, continual improvement. But how do we bake that into the culture and the ethos of the organization? Uh, does that sound about fair in terms of, uh, in terms of the maturity levels and, and what sort of ties them together, Adam? Uh, David, you've you've absolutely nailed it. Um, one thing that uh, uh, that I'll mention as well, uh, you had called out the the inspiration from CMMI, and that's absolutely true. The rationale that we used here was that these five levels are already established in the industry. 
they're well known. And we also wanted to ensure that the ITIL maturity model had interoperability with other models that exist out there as well. That, that way there, there's no sort of translation that, well, CMMI says level three, but level three in CMMI is some other number in the ITIL maturity model. So having that level of consistency was important to us as well. But absolutely great call out on these levels and how you pointed them out. Yeah, now, you know, one important thing to uh, to realize or to note about the maturity levels here, when we're actually scoring an assessment and, and we're looking at your entire service value system here, your overall maturity score is defined by the lowest level achieved by an individual component. So let me give you a real quick example of that. Let's say we look at your overall maturity and we say that um, for governance, you're, you're at a level four. And... For um, continual improvement, you're at a level three. And for your service value chain, you're at a level three. And um, let's say that for your practices, you're at a level three. But let's say that um, you don't really have any defined guiding principles. Inevitably, you have some sort of culture or value within the organization. I don't, you know, even if it's not defined, there's some sort of values. Uh, and culture in the organization. So let's say that we assess that at, let's say a level two. You're over, you will get a score for each of those components, but your overall score would be assessed at a level two. So I have to say, when I was first reviewing the material, you know, before this was released, I kind of scratched my head at this and I said, you know, does that make sense? I wonder, does that really make sense? What's going on here? But then as I started to think about it more, I said, you know, it really does make sense. Um, you know, what comes to mind, what comes to my mind is the whole notion of the theory of constraints. In, in layman's terms, we're only as strong as our weakest link, right? So, you know, if we have four areas of the organization that are doing reasonably well, but one area that's doing really poorly, um, we might actually be successful for a certain amount of time. But if we don't fix that other one, if we don't try to improve that other one, guess what? I think there's a real chance that we start to fall backwards with the other four, um, if not immediately, then eventually. The other thing that, that makes sense about it to me is that there is always a question of, you know, so what if I achieve a composite maturity score of like 2.85? What does that really mean? You know, it means I'm better than, you know, I could be, but I'm not as good as I want to be. That was always, you know, fairly subjective and hard to hard to really understand. Here, here we have, you know, discrete numbers, one, two, three, four, five. Um, you're kind of forced, you're forced to assess the maturity in a more sort of, a, I think, objective way. Okay, so this is for the maturity of the overall service value system. Well, what if you're only interested in practices? What if you don't, you're not interested in guiding principles, governance, you just want to look at some, some subset of your 34 ITIL practices, a similar but not the same um, maturity scale, right? So without going into a huge amount of depth into each one of these, if you're at a level one, your practices are not well organized. You know, you're getting some work done, but it's probably based on a lot of good people, a lot of heroes. Sometimes you accomplish your goals, but sometimes you really don't because there's no repeatable way of doing it. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we have a level five. And once again, that is really based on continual improvement. So not only are we, do we have standardized practices where they make sense, and not only are we using best practice and, and, and not blindly, but adapting best practice to our own organization, but we're trying to find ways to do a better job of that. You know, and so again, in between some organizations may say, for a particular practice, a level three is all we need, right? We have a well-defined practice, it's organized, we have dedicated roles, dedicated resources, um, we know how it interacts with other practices and other processes, and we're good with that because it may take too much for us, too much effort to get to a level four or a level five, especially with, for example, a supporting practice, right? But so the, the scale here is a little bit different than the maturity model to assess the overall service value system, but the same, I think, basic concepts are, are true. As we go from level one to level five, we have more repeatability, more consistency. We are using data in leveraging data in better ways, and we are more focused on continual improvement. So then how then do we score these, right? So let's talk about practices first of all. 
So if we're just looking at some of the 34 ITIL practices, what we do is we have two to four practice success factors defined for each of those practices. So if you're not familiar with the terminology, think critical success factor. This is something that has to happen in order for us to be successful. In this case, a PSF is just focused on very specific practices. Underneath of each of those practice success factors, we have defined capability criteria. And this is re really where um, I think some of the big value of the ITIL maturity model comes in. Defined, defined concretely for each of these practice success factors. And I'll show you an example coming up, but each of these is mapped to the four dimensions of service management. And for each practice success factor, there are really five to six um, specific capability criteria. So if we take a look at, this is just part of one example. Take a look at something like the service request fulfillment practice. So our practice success factor that's given to us is one of them, is ensuring that the service request fulfillment procedures for all services are optimized. Capability criteria, and this is just a few of them. I did not put all of these on here. The service request fulfillment procedures are defined and agreed to for key user-facing services. Responsibilities for service request fulfillment are clearly defined. Effectiveness of procedures is monitored and evaluated. In this case, each of those criteria maps directly to the value streams and process dimension of the four dimensions of service management. You know, there is no, uh, for lack of a better term here, there is no fudge factor with this. So we have a couple for service request fulfillment. There are several other practice success factors and also several other defined capability criteria. So it's not like, you know, if you're doing a true assessment here, you're not making this up. You're not making this up to doctor the score. You're not making it up to, um, <laughs> you know, to, uh, to, to appease anybody. You're making, you are using directly what Axelos has given you saying, from a best practice perspective, these are the capability criteria that, that you need to really follow to be successful. So each one of these gets its own score. You would look at each criteria, assess each one of these at its own score, and ultimately you would turn that into a, compo a composite score, or I should say a, you know, a, a total score for that particular practice that you're investigating. David, one call out that I'll mention here briefly as well, the practice success factors. Uh, those have been predefined by Axelos for all 34 ITIL management practices um, and have been published and are available via the My ITIL platform. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then again, maturity is, is assessed in a similar way. So I don't have a slide here that shows you each criteria for, for each of the components of the service value system, but in, the, in a similar way, as we have defined criteria for each of the 34 practices, each one of the components of the service value system also has defined criteria. So guiding principles has defined criteria, governance has defined criteria. And just to harken back to what I kind of mentioned earlier, um, Let's take a case like this where you're doing a comprehensive assessment or you're doing an assessment uh, of the service value system and the assessor has rated your continual improvement component as a level four, your practices are rated as uh, let's say a level three, but your service value chain is, is a level two, governance is okay, it's a level three. And uh, let's, say, let's say here that, um, your guiding principles is a level two. Based on the fact that, you know, your lowest level for one of these components is a level two, overall, overall you're assessed at a level two. So you, you would receive a report back with maturity uh, scores for each of these components, but your overall maturity would be a level two because we're saying that you're doing a great job with continual improvement, but your service value chain, for example, could use some work. David, I'll go back to a word that you used uh, from from before here. That level two, that uh, that overall maturity, is the overall maturity of the ecosystem, as David mentioned prior to. So great to know what the individual level of maturity for each component of the SVS is, and that's valuable information in its own right. But going back to David's great analogy with the theory of constraints, saying that uh, overall the ecosystem itself is at a maturity level two. 
Yeah, thank you, Adam. I mean, think of how a leader might use this. A leader might say, well, I'm really happy that I'm doing well with continual improvement. Practices look like they're doing okay and governance is okay. But man, my service value changed. Something is amiss here because in order to turn practices and governance and continual improvement into something valuable, I've got to do a better job of activities. You know, maybe it's a case where my processes are too siloed. You know, I don't really have value streams. I just have pretty siloed processes. But whatever the case is, I'm probably going to focus here because I've got to figure that thing out. Um, you know, think of things like a Pareto chart, for example. You know, looking at where I'm where I'm weakest. You know, what are the areas where I'm strong? What are the areas where I need to focus my resources to improve? Okay. So one of um, one of the valuable things that you get back after doing a maturity assessment is you get a report back. That report will give you the individual um, component scores for every item that was in within the scope of the assessment. It'll give you the overall score, but it will also give you some nice information. So this is just um, a sample slide here, but look at this nice, uh, you know, spider chart. It would show you your maturity score for each of the components, but graphically represent to you where you're strong and where you're weak. So um, a number of visuals as well as detailed analysis that would show you, um, you know, where you're doing well, where you need to improve. <clears throat> and again, we already talked a little bit about the primary and supporting practices. Now, the final portion of this is really to talk about the, um, the validation and certification. So <clears throat> there are three types of documents, three types of concluding documents that you can receive depending on the type of assessment that you have, you've had done. If you're doing a comprehensive assessment, you would receive back from Axelos ultimately a maturity certificate. This would, again, show you all the details of the things that we just talked about, of all of the um, service value system components. If you've, um, in this case, you've assessed some practices as well, it would show you the capability level of each of those practices um, and a maturity certificate that says, based on our assessment, this is the maturity level that you're assessed at and Axelos has taken a look at this and, and agrees with it, right? Similarly, for a high-level maturity assessment, you get something similar. It's called a statement of result. Um, again, an official document that would include all the details of the scope for your service value system and also capability levels of any of the practices that you decide to assess. And then if you are doing a very focused assessment just on selected practices, you also get a statement of result. It would give you that result for each of the individual practices um, you know, and any of the um, secondary practices that you look at. So this really tells folks that, you know, we know what we're doing as a service provider. Um, we've had an independent assessment. It is based on objective criteria, as objective as you get, um, you know, and it's been validated. It's been, it's been validated by a third party and not only by a consulting partner, partner, not only by an assessor, but also by the organization that, you know, leads many of the best practices in this field. Yeah, one key takeaway there also, David, is the idea that uh, the comprehensive assessment is the only type of assessment that can provide organizational certification. Uh, so if an organization is seeking that out, comprehensive assessment is the only option. Um, and also as a an extra detail. Certification is uh, is valid for three years. Axelos, however, does recommend that organizations undertake an annual reassessment as well. Yeah, that's a great point. So sometimes an organization will say, you know, we uh, you did an assessment for us beyond 20. Um, we started to implement some of those recommendations. Other ones, you know, we, we didn't get around to. They come to us a year later and say, can you take a look at this again to see, did we actually make any progress? And normally in a case like that, you know, the assessment is lighter weight. If we're looking at the same areas, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We start with where we were last time and then we say, what has changed in the meantime? So uh, that can be that can be a nice thing to do, to, to do basically a health check on whatever the scope was in the past to do a health check on that a year or so later. Um, now, for some organizations, this is going to be a big differentiator to have the validation. Um, but I think every organization is going to want to have that objective and independent, you know, 
seal of approval, so to speak. Now, finally, let's get to uh, let's get to the subject of benchmarking. Um, I don't want to be crass about this, but I'll be really direct about it because it's one of my pet peeves. Um, honestly, from my perspective, in the IT service management space right now, there really exists no reliable or very little reliable benchmarking. There are a few organizations out there that you can pay money and you can buy um, so-called benchmarking data. But you know, I would say buyer beware. Really check it out first and see what you're going to get. Uh, learn from our from our errors. We've done this kind of thing before. And when you look at what's out there, most of it is not very good. It's not very comprehensive. Um, there's a little bit of information in the market right now for service desk related um, service desk practice that is that is of varying quality. Some of it's okay, some of it's not so okay. But this is an area where I think the ITIL maturity model and Axelos are really going to shine over time. Um, as more and more organizations do true ITIL maturity assessments, this information is, is being used by Axelos. It is anonymized. So all of, all of your individual um, scores and recommendations and assessment, et cetera, are completely private. Um, this data is anonymized, but ultimately what Axelos will be able to do is to say, based on your industry, based on your region, based on your size, et cetera, this is how you compare with that particular item in your service value system or within a particular practice compared to similarly situated organizations. And that's always the difficulty. Who, who really is similarly situated? That's probably the reason why you don't have a lot of this benchmarking data on the market now. But I think as more organizations do that, this is going to become, you know, very valuable. Yeah, this is going to add um, an, an incredible level of, of depth, uh, an incredible level of knowledge. Once we get to that point where we have absorbed enough of that anonymized data uh, to be able to provide, as David mentioned, you know, real, uh, real in intelligence uh, in terms of uh, benchmarking mm. but to but to call that that detail out uh, lastly uh, keeping that data uh, in an anonymous fashion uh, in that uh, benchmarking data pool is critical for us as a client of beyond 20 you have a non-disclosure agreement with your consultant you do not have a non-disclosure agreement with axelos and to avoid that level of complication that is why uh, when that data is entered into that benchmarking pool um, it will again be anonymized if you are a financial services organization you will be categorized as such but specific names of the organization obviously that would be a detail that would be left out excellent thank you All right, so uh, I'll turn it back over to uh, to Lindsay to see if we have any questions. Hey there, um, we don't have any questions, which is shocking. I'm going to say it's because you were very thorough. Uh, <laughs> any <laughs> any closing remarks from either of you before we let these nice people go about their day? Well, I'll just say, as you, as you can probably tell, I'm super excited about this. You know, for years, it was always a little bit baffling to me why there was nothing like this um, specific to IT service management. You know, I, I recall in the DIS publication, I talked about alternatives to maturity models, but, but you know, it's like, how, how could this not exist for the ITIL framework? How could this not exist for IT service management? And I think a lot of organizations relied on other frameworks. Yeah, and that's fine. It, it served a purpose. It was good, but I think this is even better because it is very specific to the kinds of things that we that we you know live and breathe every day. So I'm super excited, and I know that um, there's already been a tremendous amount of interest in, in learning more about it. Absolutely. Um, Adam, oh, I'm sorry, Lindsay. Go I'm ahead. Sorry, can I interrupt you really quickly? We, <laughs> of course, as soon as I said we didn't have any questions, we got a question. Uh, and I think that you would be a great candidate to answer this one. We've got someone who's wondering how to become a certified assessor. Could you maybe talk about that process and um, give people a little insight into the hoops that David had to jump through to become certified and, and what that process looks like? 
Certainly. So uh, with with David, uh, David's uh, involvement in the maturity model actually started back as the maturity model was in that kind of a, a beta state. Uh, so uh, David and Erica with with Beyond 20 helped to contribute to uh, really taking a look at the maturity model in sort of its early phases and providing us with that feedback. So David's journey started all the way back there um, as an official assessor. Uh, first of all, the organization uh, must be an Axelos consulting partner, an ACP, uh, as Beyond 20 mentioned uh, earlier. Um, and then the ACP identifies a number of, uh, of, of consultants within the organization that they would like to become certified. Uh, there is an examination process and an evaluation for Axelos to designate those particular certified assessors within the ACP. Organization, so it is, um, it is an involved uh, process. Although we want to ensure that the maturity model tool itself is very objective and very consistent, uh, we also want to maintain a very high level of quality uh, amongst the the assessment com community as well. Great, thank you, Adam. I have two more questions. The first one, I'm just going to read because I'm not sure what it means. Why the number seven? There's, there's, probably, um, there's probably lots of maybe, um, I wouldn't say hidden reasons, but the number seven seems to be kind of a recurring number in ITO4. Uh, there are seven guiding principles, for instance. Uh, there are seven steps to the continual Im improvement model. I won't say that that was the reason behind it, uh, but we did need to try to find a, uh, a number that we thought was large enough to provide for a comprehensive level of assessment, um, but obviously uh, not a number that was too high to make comprehensive assessment really out of reach for uh, many or most organizations that would be interested in it, but also making sure that that number was not too low, and therefore then we would be really lowering the, the level of, of knowledge that an organization would gain through comprehensive. So there's probably a relative degree of um, maybe consistency with that number in, in the framework. It's probably more the fact that an arbitrary number had to be identified that seemed to find that appropriate balance between time and cost for achieving the comprehensive level of assessment uh, versus, say, the high level. You know, Lindsay, I've, I've thought of that too. I don't know the actual official answer here. Uh, uh, Adam would know that more than I do. But, you know, when I thought about that, I said, you know, a lot of times when organizations come to us, they, they you know, at a minimum ask to look at three practices, right? And typically, when you think in terms of value streams and how practices and even processes, you know, kind of bleed into each other, you oft I often think in terms of like, so, you know, what does my change enablement practice relate to? Where does my incident management practice go? You know, so I often think of them in pairs because it's not only pairs, right? But if you think of it that way, if somebody wants three practices and you have three supporting practices or complementary practices, um, plus continual improvement, there's there's where you get seven. So I don't know that that was actually behind it, but that was in my mind when I was reading yeah. through the initial materials. Yep, just a, a little bit more insight around that exactly, David. So the continual improvement practice is a re requirement for comprehensive and high level because the capability level of your continual improvement practice actually then becomes the means of assessing the maturity of the continual improvement element of the SVS. Um, and then you're right, then at that point in time, it does become three pairs of additional. Um, I'll tell you that the number seven as well in terms of finding a number that is quote unquote arbitrary um, in ITO4 Foundation, we designate seven practices as quote unquote key practices as well. So that's also a little bit of the uh, the rationale behind that number. Great, thank you both for that. Um, I'm gonna end it here because we're at the hour. We do have one remaining question, but I know the person who asked it, so I will get back to him after this. Um, thank you, Adam, for joining us. Thank you, David, and thank you to everybody who gave us an hour of your time today. Have a lovely rest of it. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. <laughs> Goodbye.